Hello and welcome everybody. Thank you very, very much for joining us today. Uh, you are here in the webinar, the uh, Managing Caterpillars in Industrial Hemp. Uh, heading up this discussion is Dr. Allison Justice, CEO of Hemp Mine, and also Dr. Gretchen Pettis, the, uh, one of our entomologists here at Biosafe Systems. Um, these two ladies are going to lead us in a discussion uh, going over, you know, different caterpillar types that are, you know, known in the hemp industry, sustainable management for those types of pests and uh, any other questions that you may have. Um, so to get things started, uh, any questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Please submit those questions via the Q&A option or the chat, which is found towards the bottom of your screen. Um, basically, once we've wrapped everything up, I will go over those questions and uh, we will address them to the best of our abilities. Anything after the fact, we'll have a contact slide up. So feel free to send in any additional questions that way. And again, we will address them and you know get in touch with you as quickly as possible. Um, but uh, you know, I'm sure a few more people will be rolling in, but we can get things started whenever you two are ready. Okay. Thank you so much, Laura. I am going to share my screen. All right, so thank you Biosafe, Gretchen, Laura, everyone. Um, this is a, a super exciting talk for me. Caterpillars have been one of my worst nemesis um, growing outdoor hemp, and I know a lot of the watchers as well are having this problem. So um, this is going to be not only extremely educational for the listeners, but also myself. So um, I'm going to start to introduce just by um, letting you know a little bit about hemp mine and what we do, and then we'll jump right into caterpillars. So first, just make sure uh, if you have YouTube, subscribe both to the Biosafe and the HempMine uh, YouTube channels. Um, the HempMine produces technical support videos, varietal videos, etc., and Biosafe uh, produces uh, lots of technical support videos focusing on IPM as well. All right, so what is the HempMine and, and what do we do? Uh, we're a vertically integrated um, hemp company. We do everything from breeding to making consumer goods um, with our biggest and at least my favorite part being the genetics part, um, being a plant scientist. So we do have production partners all over the U.S. Um, you can see the places in blue are where our genetics are grown and supplied to farmers. So even if you're up in North Dakota, um, we can absolutely get you plants via freight um, or, or via air shipment. So uh, we want to help you any way we can. So looking at our hemp genetic portfolio, um, we have what we like to call a full portfolio for the market. This is everything from smokable flower, um, variable flowering times. So being able to plant um, different genetics at the same exact time, yet they finish at different times, meaning you have a stagger harvest, which if you struggle with places to dry, um, this could be very beneficial. Uh, we have total THC compliant genetics um, and of course different minor cannabinoids such as CBG. Um, our newest release and you see on the right is peach haze and it is what we call a, a semi-auto flower. Um, if it's not given more than 18, 18 hours per day, it will flower. So this is an absolute beauty for indoor, for greenhouse, or even outdoor where you do have photoperiodic lighting. But the terpenes are, are pushing 3% and uh, its look and feel is right where you would want it to be for a smokable flower. We want to invite you out to our field days. Um, this year will be our third annual field days where we have variety trials. So you can come out and see, see what we're working on in person, touch and feel right at the peak of bloom. Um, we do a lot of contract research where we work with other companies on products, on projects, looking at everything from microbial um, inoculation to drying methods et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we try to, to do a lot of teaching at the field days. Um, we have vendors there. Um, Biosafe was there last year sharing their uh, information. 
And so we absolutely invite you to come out um, if you want to get on the mailing list where you can can uh, be updated of, of when and where those will be. Um, the emails here on the top left info at the hemp um, This past year, we had it in two locations in Michigan and in South Carolina. And this year we're looking to go with three locations. So we will announce that pretty soon. But by doing these field trials, uh, we're, we're really able to grasp how our varieties perform in different regions. And this is everything from pest pressure to disease pressure, um, photo period response, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, come out to the location that's closest to you and, and see how these plants perform for yourself. Um, one thing I want to throw in before we get to uh, what everybody came here for is uh, this is one of our varieties. This year is released as Luck Improved. And so this variety was chosen because of its lack of terpenes, which I know a lot of you might think, well, that's silly. But the purpose here is um, in those areas where caterpillars are really terrible, um, we've seen, at least anecdotally, that caterpillars really are drawn to some varieties over others, um, with luck being one of those where it does, um, you know, cash in at a very low terpene content, and the damage we saw was extremely low. Um, whereas, on the other hand, varieties like Cat Daddy, which have high terpenes, um, we notice really, really terrible caterpillar damage. So this is something that Alabama State and potentially maybe other universities are looking at right now of, you know, what are those secondary metabolites that are drawing in um, insects? And, you know, what's it going to look like in the future when we start to produce varieties that are intended to not attract? Um, so luck is one of those varieties that, that we're we've been able to gather this data for and hopefully um, Alabama will, will be able to publish. Um, so lastly, what we're here for um, to help get rid of these things, um, you know, for our growers, which come from a greenhouse background or from growing crops that do not struggle from caterpillars, you know, this has been absolutely devastating for a lot of farmers. Um, you know, a lot of it's regionality and um, Gresham will get into that, but, uh, you know, I, I hope this will be very beneficial in helping you to not only control, but to monitor, track, and really wrap your head around this insect um, to where we can have a, a winning chance. So with that, I will um, stop sharing my screen and begin the conversation. Thank you, Allison, for having me here. Um, you know, this is certainly a topic we get asked a lot about, and it's becoming more prominent uh, every single year. The more people that get into growing industrial hemp in an outdoor setting, uh, we certainly know the caterpillars are there. Um, and hopefully today, by the end, you'll have a, a better sense of how to at least tackle one of the major caterpillar pests and have a realization of what some of the other pests are so that you can do more research. You know, I could probably talk about this for six hours, but nobody wants to watch a YouTube for six hours about caterpillars. Um, so let me uh, share my screen. And um, I, Allison and I thought it might be nice to do something in the form of kind of a question and answer. Um, so I think that's kind of how we're going to do it today. Um, I'll jump right in. Um, so if you could give us an overview of caterpillars that are affecting hemp, you know, what, what types are they, how do they perform any detail that you think we would find interesting and helpful for hemp? Right. Well, unfortunately, um, as much as everybody is loving this whole CBD hemp, uh, movement that's gone on in the United States, caterpillars feel exactly the same way. We actually have quite a handful. So just to name a few, there's corn earworm, tobacco budworm, uh, cutworms, armyworm, salt marsh caterpillars, yellow woolly bear, uh, common stock boar, European stock boar, uh, gypsy moth, white marked tussock moth, and oblique blanded leaf roller, just to name a few. Um, so if you don't feel like giving up just yet on growing after hearing that list, we're really going to focus today on the most important caterpillar pest of 
industrial hemp in the States from what I understand. Pretty much everything I've heard, this, this one pest, the corn earworm, seems to be the number one damaging caterpillar pest to, to industrial hemp. And so I kind of wanted to start out by just mentioning that and kind of describing a little bit about the biology, if that's okay, kind of why they're so damaging. And really it's because caterpillars are nothing but a walking stomach and they increase in size about 30 times. You know, they hatch out at about two milliliter or millimeters and end up at about almost two inches. So to increase that much in size, they have to eat a lot of nitrogen. And we know we put nitrogen on our plants to make them grow and um, they do the same thing. They use that nitrogen that's in the plant to help them grow. So what I have here is actually a chart that I think is a great illustration of why you have to control caterpillars early. So it's about cassava, caterpillars on cassava, that's not important. Remember back to elementary school when you learned that caterpillars start as eggs and then they progress to caterpillars and they actually go through multiple stages called instars as they continually get larger. They then pupate and turn into a moth. So these instars are at the bottom. There's five to six for corn earworm. And this on the left side, your Y axis is your leaf area consumed. So these first four instars, they're really only eating about 20% of all of the leaf area that they're gonna eat. It's this last stage, the last two stages potentially in corn earworm, they're eating 80 to 90% of what they're going to eat. So, you know, I really wanna encourage people, if you do have caterpillars, we're gonna teach you today how to monitor them so that you can, can get a jump on them. So you don't wait till you get to this really giant, caterpillar that's going to be hard to control with any of these species that we talked about. So yeah, that's, that's the bad place. That's not where you want to be when you, when you start implementing control. Um, so just to kind of let you know, there's a, there's two caterpillars that get really confused really easily. They're challenging to distinguish the corn earworm and the tobacco budworm. They both feed on hemp. Um, the corn earworm tends to be more destructive. Um, and there's a great video that's put out by NC State University on YouTube that helps you distinguish them. And that'll become important when you do pheromone trapping to know which one you have. So that, that's the reason I bring it up. But um, just to kind of show you what a corn earworm caterpillar looks like, they have kind of a a rough skin if you pick them up, but do be careful picking them up because they will pinch you. <laughs> they will give you a nice little bite. I had forgotten about that. I was walking around your field, Allison, picking out caterpillars and I had a handful and sure enough, they just grabbed a hold and I <laughs> threw them on the ground. I forgot all about that. They can oh, be wow. cannibalistic. So they are, they are certainly um, voracious. Um, the body color can can vary from, as you've seen, from green to pink to brown. So color's not really a good way, um, but you can find multiple ones in a bud. Uh, one can do multiple tunnels into buds. So yeah, they're they're pretty destructive, and it would be it would it would behoove somebody to learn how to identify what the caterpillar is, so that they can optimize their management of it. Um, but the management, like I said, is essentially the same for the two. You just have to use a different uh, pheromone when you get into the trapping part of it. So here you can see some of the different colors that you might encounter. Just that's the same species of caterpillar, um, all in the same plot. So just a lot of variety on that. And they often curl up into this kind of C shape when you pick them up like that. Um, you can see they're super cryptic. So they're hard to see in the field. Um, do you know why they change colors? Um, you know, I really don't know why there's such a wide variability in the color. Um, that's a good question though. I'm sure somebody has studied that at some point. Um, but just know that color is not a good way to figure out which critter that you've got there. Absolutely. 
Okay. Well, so once we, we know how to identify them by letting them bite us. <laughs> um, break the skin, so. <laughs> um, you know, what, you know, a lot of what we need to cover is, is treatment options. Um, I guess let's first start with, you know, what are the cultural type management things that we can do if, if a grower just didn't want to spray anything at all? Um, what have you seen done and what has been successful? Well, these caterpillars um, for corn earworm in the Southeast, you're, you're going to have super heavy pressure. So there's a line about um, at 40 degrees North latitude, which is basically the top of Tennessee up and up where they cannot overwinter. So they actually overwinter in the soil as pupa. And so anything below the Northern border of Tennessee, they're, they can survive over winter. So <laughs> there's not a whole lot of cultural things that you can, you can do to keep them out completely, but some great practices are to keep your plants healthy. Insects have an amazing ability to find unhealthy plants, sort of like a lion on the Serengeti can, can see a, a damaged antelope and it goes after that one. Caterpillars and other insects can do the same thing. So keeping your plants healthy, you know, controlling your disease, making sure your nutrients are appropriate for whichever species in the soil that you're growing. So do your soil testing, do proper nutrition. A lot of people wanna juice their plants to push them, but all that extra nitrogen just helps those caterpillars grow even better. And you're wasting, you know, it, in a lot of ways, it's, it, it's wasting the nitrogen. Um, and I know you, Allison, have gotten, certainly done a lot of looking into what kind of nutritional optimization, and we don't really know just yet. So, you know, as much as possible, try to manage your nutrients. Um, cultivar selection, I think is gonna become a lot more important over the years. As you've shown, Allison, you have some varieties that just, whichever terpenes they are that are attractive, they attract, they bring in those caterpillars and others seem to, to have a little bit more resistance or less susceptibility. Um, and over the coming years, as we get more university research, more, you know, excellent people like yourselves doing breeding uh, to discover that, there'll be more options for people. Um, as of now, the lists are pretty, pretty short of, of known caterpillar resistant species. Um, one thing to keep in mind, this is not really a cultural practice for yourself, but if you are next to a cornfield of any type, field corn, sweet corn, you are very likely to have higher corn earworm pressure in your, in your grow operation. If you have a lot of flowers next to your grow operation, that can also be an issue. Um, now, Allison, I remember last year we went to the field day, which was which was so great to, to get to interact with the scientists and the, the, the researchers and the growers that were, that are doing this. You had some, was it buckwheat growing okay. in a patch? Mm -hmm. Yes. So tell, tell people why you had a little patch of buckwheat in your, your planting. So uh, my non entomologist thought there was that if I were planting, um, in this case, like a cover crop, which flowers, potentially I would be bringing in a beneficial insects that would feed on, you know, some, some stage of the caterpillar. Um, but to, <laughs> to my sadness, I found out that. <laughs> but I don't know that you were far, necessarily far off. I think, you know, agronomically putting in fl flowering cover crops or, or row middles, is a great practice that's used in orchards. It's used in lots of crops, especially organic production, because it does bring in a lot of beneficials. Unfortunately, this moth, it doesn't feed on anything but nectar. And so they can actually be drawn in and you're surrounded by cornfields. So you're, you know, there's, there's no hope for, you're gonna have caterpillars where you are. Um, but no, they, they feed on that nectar to help them produce eggs. So, we don't know yet. The science is not, not 
been um, established as to whether it's beneficial or not to have small patches of floral resources for beneficials. But I don't think I don't think it came from a bad place what you were thinking, but it, it is something to consider if you want to do that kind of a planting that you could be drawing in more corn earworm adults. Hmm. Makes me wonder, what if we drew them in and then treated the flowering plants? That, that is a possibility. M many pesticides can't be used on flowering plants. Um, there are some there are some options, but um, yeah, we'd have to discuss that, how you could do that, trap, draw them in and trap them in some way um, right. onto that crop. Yeah, as, as you can see, I've, I've put a lot of time into this, try, <laughs> trying to think creatively because they are terrible. And there's going to be so many more uh, treatment options in the coming years, and it's just universities have not had the option to do research until it was federally, you know, hemp became a federally allowed crop. So um, they're, they're playing a catch up game right now, uh, evaluate on all that, but I know they're working hard on it. Um, all right, so, so one other idea that mm -hmm. you might turn down, um, you know, I notice there's a lot of birds um, that I will see them swoop down. I will, I find, um, excrement on the plants where it looks like one's propped up and is just chowing down. So would it make sense for one to, uh, you know, figure out what type of, of bird that is that enjoy caterpillars the most and maybe put up bird boxes and even bat boxes? I, I, I don't see any problem with that. I, I always encourage, you know, utilizing our our partners in, in growing, which are you know the beneficial insects and birds and bats. Unfortunately, we don't have good data on you know, how many of these caterpillars birds are, are eating or bats are eating. I certainly don't think it's a bad idea to you know, encourage wildlife around your plots. Um, but as of right now, we just don't have any definitive data. And really how they do those studies is they will they will capture and kill birds and, and examine their stomach contents to find out what they're eating. And if there's somebody out there that's interested in that kind of research, um, it would be wonderful to, to let people know uh, or, to, or to do that kind of discovery work to find out if that could be beneficial. Although from our experience with um, you know, other crops and this pest, even if birds reduce numbers, they're not gonna eliminate them. So um, they, they could be one small piece of the larger integrated pest management that we always encourage with crops. You know, there are no silver bullets. And when you're dealing with a crop like hemp that doesn't have a lot of registered products that you can use, you have to get creative and you have to utilize everything at your, at your disposal to your benefit. Absolutely. All right, well, let, let's back up a second and tell us how do we know when we have caterpillars? What do you look for? That's a great question. Um, you know, one way you could look is to see if you can find eggs. Allison, how many eggs have you seen in your field just walking through, would you say? Um, well, I've seen lots of eggs, whether yeah. if I know that they're caterpillar eggs or not, or I'm not sure. They're, um, they're tiny, right? Tiny. Like, super easy to, to miss. Just walking through, I think most people would not, it's like the size of a head of a pin. Those eggs are just very small. Um, so, you know, yes, you could look for eggs, but um, really looking for the adult moths because the moths are going to lay the eggs, right? That's, we're going to talk about how to monitor for those uh, because they are night flyers. So that's really the only time you might see them, maybe around your lights, you know, your back door lights or, or field lights that you have. Um, they're kind of nondescript, so you might not really, you know, they might just look like any other moth that's up there. So learning how to identify corn earworm adults can be a helpful thing to do. Um, the thing that I, I most, I find is the help, most helpful way to find caterpillars when they're feeding is, I mentioned caterpillars are walking stomachs. What comes in has to come out. So looking for frass. So um, here, 
with the white plastic down, this is underneath some plants. All these specks here are not dirt. If you get up close, they're, they're kind of cohesive, um, chewed up plant material, essentially. You might also see it on the plants themselves. So here's a bud where a caterpillar had been removed and you can see these, these are wet because it was kind of wet out that day, but they can also be dry pellets um, that indicate that a caterpillar has been feeding. So the, the caterpillars can be, like I said, a bit cryptic. So frass is really the best way I found. But then also you may see some chewing damage. The caterpillars, this is, um, you can see some chewing damage here on the right. I'm gonna zoom in on it um, so you can see a little better hmm. there. So, um, you know, you, here you can see a stem that's been completely fed on um, here and here, there's lots of little bits. But in general, the caterpillars are not gonna do a lot of feeding on those leaves because what they want to get to is the really good nutritious stuff. And where is that at? In the bud. The bud. Yes, the place where we least want them to be. Right. Um, so when we really start, should start looking for our caterpillars is right at flowering. That's, that's your critical time. And for a lot of these other caterpillars, you may find them on your plants chewing on the leaves but the ones you have to be most concerned about are like the corn earworm that burrow into the buds. These plants can handle a fair amount of chewing damage to the leaves, but once they get in the bud, you start getting, or here you can see some more chewing damage, kind of tattered looking on the edges from small larvae, but you know they can actually clip stems. So here you can see frass, you can see a bit of a, a bud that's fallen off from them clipping the stems. Here's two of the culprits right there. But another thing that, that becomes an issue and that you can look for is this uh, bud rot resulting from the mechanical damage of the chewing and the environmental pathogens that are, you know, botrytis is everywhere but it doesn't have an entry point until that caterpillar starts chewing on those buds and it provides that, that entry to come in. So uh, that's a great way to scout for them and know that you have some, some larger caterpillars that are doing damage to the buds. Yeah. It also should, would indicate that you might wanna go out with something that could um, help prevent disease as well so that you don't get a progression of that bud rot. Right. Well, if, if I'm seeing this damage, if I'm seeing frass, is it too late? Should I just give up? Don't give up. <laughs> <laughs> In Tennessee, we can have, um, you know, something like three generations a year. I imagine South Carolina might even be able to go into a fourth generation because of the, the temperatures. Yeah, lucky you. <laughs> um, people up north may have two to three. As I mentioned, there's a there's that 40 degree north latitude line. Below that, they can overwinter. So they're gonna just start right away. Above that, they, you know, say you live in Michigan or Ohio, they, they, the moths can fly long distances. They can come up on thermals and start feeding. It's not too late. So you just have to get on top of this large, or of the population that you currently have and make sure you get protections on. So for the subsequent generations, right. definitely don't give up. It's, it's not too late at this point. I mean, there's still plenty of good buds left on this plant. You know, you wouldn't just pull that, yank that one out of the ground and throw it away. So, um, you know, generally when you start seeing this kind of damage, it means the caterpillars are fairly large at that point and they're gonna be harder to control. So you'll need to do a higher rate of application or more frequent applications in order to, to get control of them. So that's what it should tell you is, oh, I've got big caterpillars. I need to up my rates or I need to up my intervals between or, or reduce my intervals between sprays. Got it. Okay, so I'm not too late, but how do yeah. I... How do I do my best to avoid getting to this point? You know, how can we be preemptive and, and monitor to where, you know, it is hard, sometimes it's hard to see that there's moths. So what, 
you know, how can we monitor them in another way to understand, well, there's one moth I should have sprayed last week. Right. So that's, that's a really good question because, you know, this can be hard to see. The eggs are hard to see. The caterpillars are hard to see. The moths fly at night. You know, what are, what are you going to do? Well, fortunately, corn earworm has been a major pest of corn for a really long time. They've studied it over hundreds of years, essentially, in agriculture because it's such an important pest. And we can use the data and information from the corn researchers and apply it to hemp management of this particular pest in particular. So there's actually a trap and we set this one up at Allison's farm at the hemp mine in South Carolina last summer. Um, and I'm, I recommend using pheromone trapping. Essentially it's the special kind of trap called a Heliothus style trap. And I can, we can give links when we send out the, um, the recordings of this. Um, but you can order these online. I recommend putting them out by midsummer. And on these are a pheromone. It basically smells like a female moth and you replace these every two weeks. You just, you can buy them um, and I'll, I'll also give links for that and, and show you, but you hook it to the inside of this trap. So this kind of hole at the bottom, you put this, this pheromone lure the male moths will come in at night, fly up into that funnel and into the top part. And I, as I mentioned, you want to put these out by midsummer. And the reason, because because typically you don't really worry about corn earworm until you're you're flowering. But if you put it out midsummer, you can start recording what a baseline number of moths is, so that you can tell when the moth numbers are going up. So I recommend checking these traps. You can check those two to three times a week. It just takes a few minutes to look in there, see how many moths there are. You can, can freeze them or kill them however you want to count them, but record your data and look at it every week to see what's happening with your moth numbers. Now, so not for, this is not for trapping to kill. This is trapping to monitor. That's a great point. This will draw in these male moths, um, and, but it's not gonna control the moths. No matter how many of these you put out, it's not gonna give you moth control. This is simply a way to see how many are out there in your environment and maybe coming in. Um, these traps are between 60 to $80. Um, the, the lures are fairly inexpensive. I think less than $10 or $15 for a whole season. Um, and it, boy, if it can get you a, a head start on treating those, those larvae young, you can save a significant amount of, of your, your profits. Uh, I think it's a, an investment well worth your time and your money to, to do this. And, and there's I'm, lots of absolutely. videos online of like corn, like corn education. Watch <laughs> about how to set these up. That's, it's a great way to learn that. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. I know I will definitely have plenty of these. Um, with that, how many do I need per acre? Um, you know, I like to put like for, I would say I would have one per five acres or so. Um, it doesn't have to, you don't have to have a whole lot of them or a huge network. You might want to put one on one edge of your field and one at another edge of your field just to kind of see where they're coming in. You do want to make sure there's, it's not like up in a tree line or anything like that. So there's plenty of airflow to carry that, that pheromone scent. Um, again, we don't really have good, <clears throat> um, recommendations for how many we might need to monitor. But, you know, if you have one per five to 10 acres, it'll, it'll let you know. I mean, those pheromones carry a good way and the, and the moths are amazingly skilled at finding them. Hmm. So once you, <clears throat> so this is the part you're going to check where I have that green circle. You're going to look in there, you know, some people check every day, um, but if you can only do it two times a week, it's better than nothing. And what you're going to see inside here is a, a photo inside that little bag. And the nice thing is it only catches corn earworm. 
adults. So some people use light traps. I've seen people try to do that. Um, there's other kinds of bucket traps, but the problem is you catch all different kinds of insects. And unless you want to get a, a PhD in entomology and figuring out what those all are, um, this, I mean, this draws in exactly what you're wanting to, to look at. And um, you just don't have to deal with, with all of that time and, and figuring out what everything is, because um, these are your main concern. So here's uh, just the name of what that trap is, this Heliothus style trap. There's a couple places you can get it, Gempler's, Great Lakes, IPM. And the lures that we used with you, Allison, were the Century Trace lures, the, the um, corn earworm lure there. So same places you can, you can find those. Um, but now would be a great time to check. So once you realize you have them, gosh, what, what's the threshold? Like when, when, do you, when do you know to treat? When you have one moth, when you have 10 moths? Again, we can kind of look at sweet corn because we, we don't have established thresholds for hemp. They just haven't been done yet, but we could use sort of organic sweet corn thresholds, what they've used. Um, I mean, essentially it kind of goes by temperature because insects are temperature dependent. They will continue, they will grow faster the warmer the temperature is. So this is uh, number of moths per trap per day, but you could also average it out depending on, you know, if you check just two times a week. So um, if you have like one half to one average moths per, per day, you would wanna start, and it was less than 80, you would wanna start treating every five days. So one moth may be enough to start treatment. Yeah. So, but if the temperature is above 80, which it often is in South Carolina, you might be treating every four days. When you get up to 13 moths in a trap, this is for sweet corn again, you may be spraying every three days if it's less than 80 and every two days when it's greater than 80 degrees. Mm. That's something, right? Again, this is for sweet corn. It may not hold true for hemp, but it does at least give us some sort of a sense of, of what's going on in our environment and what our, you know, whether we need to step up our scouting. Cause I've often said that scouting is the new spraying because if you, if you find that you're just not getting that many attacks to your, to your hemp and you're, and you have 13 moths, then you can hold off on your sprays. But I would say in general that uh, when you start, your numbers start going up, and it's at flower, you need to get start getting those sprays out within a couple days. Absolutely. Yeah. So what do we spray? <laughs> well, there are a number of treatment options. Of course, please check with your state, check with your processor to make sure that they are okay with anything that you're putting on your plants. Um, but as of right now, we've got some great research coming out of of Virginia Tech. I don't know if you know Katie Britt. She just finished her PhD program there looking at hemp. She'll be going out to UC Riverside to, to do some more work out there. Um, but she did some great trials this summer looking at some, some various options. So Bacillus thuringiensis is one that people have likely heard of, or BT. This is a bacterial biopesticide. And there's several different varieties of it. Now, Biosafe Systems has one called BT Now. That's our BT Kerstocki type. In general, BTKs or BT Kerstocki does not work well on corn earworm, but the combination of um, cryotoxins, you know, it's just the special strain that we have, seems to do an adequate job on corn earworm. But I would say most of them on the market that have been tested, like Dipel. Um, and some of those don't seem to have as good of activity on this group of moths. Hmm. So if you, if you don't use the BT now, you can also use a BT variety Izawi, um, products like Agri or Zentari. It's just a different strain. They'd have some different crytoxins that affect that group of insects better. Now, that being said, all of these 
still don't show you much more than 50% control yeah. in a best case scenario. Um, so that timing becomes very critical. Catching those young stages, they're gonna be most vulnerable at the young stages. The other, there's one other Bacillus thuringiensis that people may be aware of is the BT israeliensis. People use it for fungus gnats. It's not gonna be effective at all. So don't, don't put that one out there. Another one I see people using a lot more is these viruses that are specific to caterpillars. And um, it's the Helicoverpa, a Heliothus nuclear polyhedrosis virus. Um, this is one where basically the, the insect catches a virus, it crawls to the top of the plant and dies and keeps spreading the virus out into the rest of the, the population. So this is one I've seen people have good results with. It's always good to not rely on one product though. So if you're using the virus, it makes sense to rotate with something like a BT and the virus so that you can get the benefit of both of them um, and not develop any kind of resistance issues. Because insecticide resistance is, a, is gonna be, become more and more important over the years. Um, and then there's a couple other options. Um, you know, azadiractin is one. We use this more inside in the greenhouses, but they, it's actually a good caterpillar product and can be mixed with BT or with the virus um, and may have some benefit. We, we don't really know yet. We're hoping to, to do that research this summer. Um, so Biosafe has a, a Bovaria bassiana, which is an intima pathogen. Um, so it also has a efficacy on caterpillars um, that may help boost the, the BT uh, efficacy, you know, by mic tank mixing or something like that. We, we just don't know at this point, but we know all of these can be a piece of your IPM management program. But mm -hmm. all of these work best when the larvae are young, they have to be eaten. So coverage is important. So if you've never paid attention to your spray nozzles or your sprayer, um, you know, this, it would be a good time to, to kind of think about what your spray pattern looks like, how, what kind of coverage you're getting on your plants. Uh, the better coverage you get, the better chance you have of getting good, good control. So then if it rains, does it wash it off? That's a great question. Um, so for most of these, they recommend that you don't apply when you're expecting rain within, you know, six to 12 hours. Um, they can be washed off. You know, there's, there's good in indications that they can be washed off, but if you have a good six hours and the, the larvae are actively feeding, they should get enough of a dose for it to be effective. If it's going to rain within an hour or two, I would hold off and do the application at another, another time, maybe the next day or, or after that rain event and the, and the plants have dried off just a touch. So being that some of these products are um, alive, you know, what's the storage for, for this? Um, you know, um, can I keep it in my really hot barn or does it need to stay in the refrigerator? Right. As you mentioned, these are living organisms. Um, the virus, I think, is a little bit more, um, has a little bit longer shelf life, like maybe two years. I, I don't know all the specifics on that one. I know for the BT, you have about 18 months at room temperature. So if you put it in a really hot barn or leave it in your truck, you're going to kill off those bacteria and not get the kind of control that you expect. You don't have to refrigerate it, but if you do, you will get a longer shelf life on it. Uh, just don't freeze it because uh, sure. that could cause damage to, to the organisms. Wow, such good information. <laughs> a lot to remember and a lot to know. Yes. Um, and again, always check with your state and processor before you apply anything to your plants because yeah, we don't want any, any accidents like that um, where your stuff gets turned down. But there's one other option that I would like to bring up. You know, we talk about chemicals all the time, but, you know, Allison, you want to encourage beneficials, right? Because they are basically nature's hit squad. They're doing the pest management for us and we want to work with it. So all of the products that I mentioned are extremely compatible with biological control. 
So one thing that we did last summer that BioSafe did is put together a biocontrol program in combination with the BT to help increase your efficacy. And so what we have encouraged is the use of these trichogramma wasps. This is a little teeny tiny parasitic wasp that parasitizes caterpillar eggs only. Doesn't parasite, parasitize the caterpillar. So call up, this is from Beneficial Insectary. That's who we worked with on this program, but um, there's different species of trichogramma that might be more appropriate for where you are. So talk with a biocontrol supplier, but you would put these out basically right at flowering or right when your pheromone trapping showed that there were moths that were coming in. So these trichogramma are, have this amazing sensitivity to finding these eggs. They're gonna crawl all over your plant, lay an egg, of one of their eggs and a caterpillar egg, and it basically stops the life cycle. And then you can follow up after, you know, maybe four or five days with your BT Now applications. Um, and these cost, I guess, probably you put one per acre. And I think it, we calculate it comes out but about eight or nine dollars an acre. So it's not a super expensive option for you. Um, and it could, could really do, do some good because then, you know, the caterpillars don't even survive to start feeding on your crop. Um, yeah. But it's not, it's also not foolproof. So you might want to have a backup. And if anybody wants to check this out, we do have um, this program on our website. You can, can download it, take a look at it, um, or discuss with somebody at BioSafe if that's something you want to pursue uh, this summer for your, for your caterpillar pests. Wow. <sighs> have learned so much and also so much to learn, uh, <laughs> but I've definitely got a few more tools in my toolbox that will absolutely help. Yeah. And, and again, we only talked about one of the major caterpillar pests. <laughs> There's lots out there. Um, but fortunately, um, the BT product at least will work on all caterpillars. The, the virus is very specific to corn earworm. So if you're battling lots of different caterpillar species, the BT and maybe the botanicals might be a, a better option for you. Um, and then when you have corn earworm pressure, bring in your, your NPV or the nuclear polyhedrosis viruses um, to try that. Wow. And then we haven't even talked about aphids and mites and all of those. Oh, just, just one at a time. <laughs> give up the one farm there? No, <laughs> one at a time. Um, there's there are great strategies out there. Uh, just keep educating. You know, keep educating yourself. That that that's all you can do. Um, all right. I guess we'll answer questions now, and I'm gonna I'm gonna share a screen for contact information in case anybody wants to get a hold of. Um, Gretchen or myself. Perfect. Thank you both. So um, I'm just going to go through the questions that were submitted. Um, some of them were addressed a little, but perhaps there's um, some more detail that you could go in depending on the, the question. So the initial question came from a Thomas Brooks said, are all of your cultivars of hemp approved in other states other than it says so car? I'm not sure if that's supposed to be so cal. Um, and then Florida has a specific list of approved cultivars. Yeah, um, so Florida for sure. Um, we have a partner down there that, that has all our varieties that's growing and selling. Um, keep in mind the photo period there. And so we have varieties that we would pick over others because of that. I'm happy to talk more about that offline, but um, at this point, I'd say we're in most every state. Um, you know, there's certain places like California where you have to register with every county, so I'm not going to say we're everywhere, um, but usually it's a pretty easy process that takes a week or, or less. Um, so, yeah, um, I, I imagine wherever you are, we could figure out how to get into it. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh the next question, same, also from Thomas, was uh, what is the range of this caterpillar? I know uh, Gretchen was mentioning, you know, depending on where you are in the country, certain caterpillars will affect, you know, you differently. Um, so I guess in specifically with the 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 corn, the, the corn one we were just focusing yeah. on, what is the range? Um, pretty much the entire United States into Canada. So it will depend a lot on the year. Uh, they can be highly variable from area to area. 
In the Southeast, we tend to have them more predictably. Um, up in the, the Midwest and up into Canada, it will depend a lot because these, these moths have to migrate essentially. So they, they actually ride these thermal winds like you know, mile up in the atmosphere and blow hundreds and hundreds of miles uh, into areas. So I've, I've heard of corn earworms coming as early as July in Iowa and as late as September. So that's why this fer the pheromone trapping is a, a really good idea because you don't wanna start spraying. I mean, you could save yourself the money of, of doing treatments if you, if you don't have them there. If you do your trapping and there's, there's nothing there, you're, you got lucky that year. Um, in the Southeast, I think we're pretty much gonna see them almost every year, uh, at, but at varying levels. Because we can still have, you know, we could have a cold winter. We we can have some conditions that might uh, suppress the populations in some years. Um, the next question also from Thomas was, do these caterpillars have predators? Um, I know you mentioned there are some birds. Uh, somebody else responded with, I've seen wasps regularly feed on oh, caterpillars. Yeah. but And I assume that would be regional also. There's going to be certain predators in certain areas of the country. Um, but do they have additional predators that, you know, hopefully are going to be helping us out? Yeah, there's lots of beneficial insects. There's parasitic wasps. There's predatory wasps. So, you know, those, those yellow jackets we love to hate. They are great caterpillar killers. I mean, they've got a lot of babies to feed. So, um, yeah, don't don't kill all your wasps. They're they're good for you. Um, I've heard of of mice and vole and moles, not voles, um, that can actually feed on on caterpillars as well. I don't know about corn earworms specifically, but I know I was working with um, a corporate campus in. Uh, the Northeast, and they had a huge gypsy moth year. And when the gypsy moth went away, the mouse population just exploded because the mice were eating so many gypsy moth uh, larvae. So I would imagine there's quite a few things that do do feed on them in the, in the field. Okay. Um, all right. Next question was, uh, again, which you, you addressed, um, does high heat or prolonged sunlight break any of the, uh, the different, I, the, I'm sorry, the different products that you were talking about for the applications and you did speak about storage, but let's say you've, you know, you were talking about rain, but let's say it's going to be a really hot and sunny day and you're planning to apply one of these products could, one of those applications be affected by, you know, it being hot. Right. You, you can apply all of these products. Um, Bavaria doesn't do great when it's super hot. It does better in a cooler, cooler conditions, but the, the BTs and the NPV viruses, uh, you can spray those at any time, but we always encourage people applying them in the evening or on overcast days because they are all susceptible to UV degradation. So sunlight could break all these down. And many of these caterpillars do a lot of their feeding at night. So if you spray them in the late afternoon, you minimize the solar breakdown and you maximize the amount that the caterpillars are going to feed. Okay. Um, and specific to the, the treatments that you were mentioning, are any of these pesticides flagged during flower testing? Do they negate the organic status of the crop? Um, I can only speak to our products, um, and it's going to depend on your processor, I'm sure. Um, but we have not had any issues with BT uh, being flagged. Um, the, all the products I mentioned that are biosafe products are OMRI listed, uh, so there is no organic uh, issues with, okay. with that applying those products. Okay. You would need to check with each of the, any other product that you use, you would want to check on that. All right. Um, the next question is specific to the virus. What is the level of efficacy of that treatment? Um, you know, I think from what I've seen on the research, I, you know, you can maybe 50 to 60%. Um, there may be higher, higher. I haven't seen all of the research on that one, on that particular product. Um, the Another question, which was not specific to what we listed as treatment, but somebody asked about neem oil for treatment of caterpillars. 
Um, so there's a lot of confusion actually about neem oil and azadiractin. There are, so when, when neem oil is extracted and it's sold as hydrophobic extract of neem oil, it has no azadiractin in it. So it simply becomes a crop oil. Um, so at that point, you know, you might get some activity, but if there's no azadiractin in it, it's not going to have as much of an insecticidal effect. So any neem that you would apply, any neem product, you would want to make sure it had a you know, certain percentage of azadiractin in it. Um, and I think one thing, Allison, we talked about that I didn't get to, I didn't mention was using surfactants and other adjuvants with these products. Um, so certainly you can use spreader stickers and to help you with your coverage. So if, if you feel like you're not getting great coverage, that can be something you can add. Check with your manufacturer or whoever produces that material to make sure it's gonna be compatible. But I know with the BioSafe that the organosilicone surfactants work really well and any of the non-ionic spreader sticker or surfactants are gonna be acceptable. Um, all right, I'm just kind of trying to stay on the theme here. Hold on one second. Um, somebody asked specifically, and I, I, I'm making sure I'm reading this right, but it sounds like all of the, uh, the treatments that we've been talking about have been specific to the caterpillar themselves. Are there treatments for the moths other than this monitoring trap that you mentioned? Yeah, and, and remember, the trapping is not a control strategy. It's just a monitoring. Um, you know, there, probably pyreth there are some organic pyrethrins that probably could knock the moths down, but the problem is they're so mobile and they're coming in from other places that it would be challenging to, to do an application that effectively targeted the moths without potentially damaging pollinators because we are discovering that hemp is a, is a massively important uh, pollen and nectar source for, for bees and other pollinators. Uh, so that would always be something that should be top of mind when you're doing applications. Okay. Um, okay. Um, another question about neem oil. Does neem oil with active ingredients hamper host future, future beneficials? Um, Azadiractin has been shown to be fairly, work fairly well with beneficials because it does have a fairly short life, you know, half-life in the sunlight. Um, so I would say that it is compatible with your beneficial applications. Um, another, uh, perhaps this is a rumor mill question. Any thoughts on silicates, potassium silicate or silicate dioxide to strengthen plant defenses, foliar or drench perhaps? Yeah, I think this is an area that's going to grow. Any kind of plant stimulating biostimulants or silicas that, that enhance the, the plant's systemic response, um, you know, please be careful. Some of, the, some of them can be helpful for diseases and insects, but the research is still being done to, to really show how much benefit. There is no plant stimulant that you can put on there that's going to 100% protect your plant or even probably 80% protect your plant. It, they just um, don't have that kind of um, activity. Um, let me just go through this one more time, make sure I didn't miss anything. I think I addressed everything um, and I'm not seeing any new questions coming in. So um, obviously for those who might be trying to send something in right now and maybe we're not gonna get to it, please make sure you take down these uh, email addresses. They will go, you know, we will get them to these, to these ladies so they can answer your question, you know, or if you need a more thorough answer, please follow up with us. We definitely wanna make sure that you, uh, you know, get the information that you're looking for. Um, but uh, thank you both. It was both very, uh, it was informational and I, I think, uh, so far, the comments are looking like everyone's very pleased. So that's awesome. great. Well, Allison, it was a pleasure to have a caterpillar discussion with you. I'm sure we'll be talking caterpillars more this summer. Yeah, absolutely will. <laughs> and I right, definitely thanks, encourage, everyone. Yeah, I definitely encourage people 
to, to look at your cooperative extension and your state and keep following the research that they're doing and sharing. Uh, they're working hard and they're gonna give you the most scientifically based sound information um, that's out there. All right, thank all right. you all. Um, thank you, have a great Thanks everybody. Day.